from Emily again, launched a VC firm focused on cannabis specifically after her and her brother uh, went through an event when they were younger where their parents passed away and they saw the use uh, that could have made it, you know, they're basically exiting life much uh, more comfortably. Uh, 25 million bucks raised, doing deals anywhere between, you know, four, five, six hundred grand, typically leading late seed and early series A. This is The Top, where I interview entrepreneurs who are number one or number two in their industry in terms of revenue or customer base. You'll learn how much revenue they're making, what their marketing funnel looks like, and how many customers they have. I'm now at $20,000 per talk. Five and six million. He is hell bent on global domination. We just broke our 100,000 unit soul mark. And I'm your host, Nathan Latka. This is episode 757. Coming up tomorrow morning, you learn from Ethereum founder Anthony Delorio. He is the ex stock exchange brain behind the Ethereum blockchain. Be sure to tune in to learn more about crypto. Hello, everybody. My guest today is Emily Paxia. She's the founder of Poseidon Asset Management, and she shifted her focus entirely to this industry, the cannabis industry, in 2013. Since that time, she has taken her experience of researching markets, companies, and strategic opportunities and turned it entirely to the world of cannabis. Her focus on understanding where the market is headed rather than where it has been has been critical to building a diverse portfolio of companies that span the sector. With over 15 years working in the Fortune 500 and... and Obviously, those companies develop products, resolve strategic errors, and address new market, uh, new target audiences. Her work has been fundamental to stewarding the companies and their por- and the portfolio companies along their paths to success. Emily, are you ready to take us to the top? I'm ready. So, hey, we skip. I mean, the bio really skipped over. Really, I think what you do. I mean, you are a VC firm for cannabis, correct? That is correct. We invest in the industry. Yeah. So, give me some background. I mean, did you come from traditional VC, or you came from those Fortune 500 companies? No, I came from a space of looking for opportunities for companies to expand their market share and really grow their user base. And for me, looking at the cannabis industry was like looking at an absolute white space of opportunity where there was all this demand for product and there were not enough products or services to really meet the demand or to meet the businesses trying to run and solve for that demand. And so... I uh, called up my brother, and we'd always had a compassionate lens around cannabis because um, our parents both had passed from cancer, and a hospice nurse had brought this up at an early age that cannabis could have been helpful towards that end of life. How so? so how, what would your if your parents did take cannabis? How would it have helped them? Um, so when you're dying from cancer, you're given a myriad of medications, all that have one side effect, and then you take another one for the side effect, and it just goes around. So you're just you're either nauseous or you're uncomfortable or anything. You're not sleeping, all of those things, and all of these things can be remedied by using cannabis appropriately. And uh, many cancer patients do find a great deal of relief from from this medication. So that would have been something I would have liked for them to have at end of life. And um, so I think that we always saw it as more then some people joke about cannabis as medicine we, we think it's very serious so um, but you know from a business perspective we really just saw all of this pent-up demand and a lot of opportunity to improve efficiencies in the business and, and improve in the branded products and the ways that it, people these companies were connecting with the uh, patients or consumers so how old were you when your parents passed away um, 16 and 21. Got it. So So, uh, definitely not the age where you could understand what's happening, but maybe still in school. So you weren't sure what to do about it. Not yeah, Not much to know what to do about it, but still um, very much in that receiving of information phase of life where you're seeing people go through something that's life changing for you and yeah. And all for them. So. So you see this opportunity happening. Mm -hmm. Why? What? Where were you working right previous to this? I was working at a company called Minor & Co. Studio, and a lot of our clients included American Express, Viacom, um, some fashion companies like uh, Ralph Lauren, consumer packaged goods companies like PepsiCo, and, you know, all fighting for, ton, you know, mass market share with other massive corporations. And I want to get in your in your brain a little bit, because, I mean, launching a VC firm is a lot like launching a startup. I mean, it's very, very yeah. risky. Um, where were you yeah. financially when you made this decision? Like, had you already kind of in your mind rationalized because you saved up a buffer from these corporate jobs? Like, like, or what, what was your thinking? Yeah, um, that's exactly right. Uh, as financial professionals, as we were embarking on, it was something that we had to assess our own risk tolerances and what we could really take on. And so we 
you know, made sure that we put enough aside and then also that we could invest in the fund alongside of our investors because we believe that that's really important to be um, both, you know, mentally invested but also financially invested. So um, we went we went around that route and we also had some um, good advisors, great support to help us get this all set up. And I would say that actually the lawyers and the auditors and all the groups that worked with us back in 2013 to get this really going they were taking quite a chance because the industry was really young then and we didn't really know where it was headed. So, yep. so how much, uh, what, what's the fund size now and how much of that is your own capital that you put in? And then we'll be launching our second fund. Um, right as it stands, I believe we're at a, still at about 10% of the capital of that fund, but that's also through the growth of our fund. Yep. So, and you'd cut yeah. out right when you said the amount. What, what's the size of the fund today? Oh, it's at about 20 million today, and we're wrapping up closing at about 25. Got it. And and in addition to the returns you've generated on your own money, plus the initial seed capital you personally put in, you're at about two million. So, about you're representing about 10% of the fund. Yes, exactly. That's great. And who's we? You and your brother? Uh, my, yeah, my brother is my business partner. Do you guys fight? No, actually, it's a real like it's a real treat to work with my brother. We're very different in many ways and very similar where it matters. So it's when, a really strong relationship. Tell me about the last decision where he brought you something you disagreed with and he convinced you and you gave in. <laughs> um. There is a turnaround story. One that comes to mind is this company called Cerna back in 2015. We were already invested in it and they'd gone public and they'd had a ton of trouble. How do you spell and, it? S-U-R-N-A. Okay. And, uh, you know, they, they'd gone through a lot of pain points. The founder was leaving. There were just it was, it was looking grim and we were already invested in it. And Morgan came to me with the idea to buy out the founders shares. Morgan's your brother. Yep. Morgan is my brother. Yes. And I was, I, I thought he was real. I was like, Ooh, this one's tough to get behind, but, um, he was right. And then he joined the board and really helped them get on track. Um, and I think they're doing a lot of really great things. Personally, I think it's a great company because it's, uh, doing cultivation efficiencies, which is really beneficial to the bottom line, but also for using energy and land and land. Yeah. So, and they've got some really cool projects, but, um, so that was one that I was like, Ooh, I'm trusting you buddy on this one. And give me an example the other way, what, an idea you brought to him and he was like, oh, there's no way, Emily. And then you convinced him. Um, it was actually, it was this company called uh, Work, W-U-R-K. Um, we just and, had them on the show, actually, very oh, recently. Yes, that's right. Yep. Yep. Fortuitous. Um, yep. Yes. And so Keegan, um, I was very impressed by Keegan's presentation and you know, you know, when you first look at something, it may appear one dimensional. So it's hard to sometimes understand the potential growth trajectory of a company like that. And also in our space, it's always understanding what the kind of what the moat is that protects a, a small startup from a big corporation from just coming in and doing what they are doing. Um, and so it took a little talking with Morgan about it. And then once he got into it, he was really on board. So I think, but at first I was like, maybe we should just take a look at this one a little more. <laughs> so hey guys, that, episode, that episode, if you want to get more context on what Keegan's doing is, is a few back. It's episode 735. It's basically think like HR and payroll management for the cannabis industry specifically, which is very difficult. Most people, it's like a, a brief case of cash that they're trying to take to the bank without getting robbed or beat up or something else. So they passed 200 customers, $20 monthly ARPU, over 50 grand a month in revenue and they've raised 3 million bucks. What of the 3 million, Emily, how much, how much is you guys? Oh gosh, I should know that off the top of my More head. More than a million? Um, I don't think so. Okay. I think we're right. Yeah. Right in there, but are, we led the last round for that. So, so you guys have a, you and your brother, Morgan, you guys have a good kind of yin and yang back and forth. Yes. Now I'm going to ask a question that you're going to totally judge me for, but I think my audience is probably wondering, like, are you guys always high? <laughs> So people always ask me this, and the answer is no, obviously. I'm not high right now. Um, and I, I have very specific beliefs about how I think people should use cannabis in their lives like they should use anything in their lives, including coffee or any medication that they might be taking, because I think if it impairs your ability to do your work, then you should set it aside while you're doing your work. But I do think that 
Um, there are, you know, sometimes I'll take CBD if I'm having a lot of um, stomach pain or something like that, but it doesn't get you high as you probably have studied. Um, but, you know, I think that it, it really is about personal choice. And when people ask me if our founders are high, I'm like, do you think that Silicon Valley, they're not using cannabis oh, down there? I mean, nootropics, <laughs> Iwasaka, we, oh, you name it. They're doing all the things. Yeah, I ask so. you that question, not because I believe you are. I know you're not, but because I assume that's your biggest obstacle on this, is most people just assume that everyone in this industry is like a druggie and high and bad human beings, and it's just not the case. Mm -mm. Yeah. No, you know, I think it's more like a, a wellness industry, like a craft industry. I, I think a lot about coffee and craft beer or wine when I think about this industry. So. so someone's listening right now. They're thinking about getting into the cannabis industry and they're going, should I reach out to Emily? Tell me what kind of deals you're looking for. We are, that's a good question. Right now we're in the middle of vetting quite a few opportunities. I mean, we really do like uh, business technology solutions um, that really help businesses to run more effectively and efficiently and transparently. So things around that. Um, agriculture technology solutions, I'm very interested in that. And there are some interesting new areas that are coming out. Like growing efficiency stuff? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And especially in terms of looking towards, you know, the greenhouses that are going to be um, going crazy in California. And just because that is a more um, viable route for these massive growths to go in the future. Outdoor greenhouse, I really think, is the way. But um, so looking at things like that, also ways that you can really track the genetics of your plants so that you can understand what you're growing and how it's performing and all and, and those aspects of the cultivation side of things. If I forced you and said you and Morgan have to give up VC and you actually have to go build your own company in this space, what's one that you wish existed that just doesn't exist right now? Oh, I feel like the Jeopardy music needs to be like. <laughs> no, this is, I mean, very interesting because okay. I assume there's still a lot of oh, kind of, you know, blue ocean right out there in this space. And you are the person that's probably thought of, why isn't there a company doing X? I think this is going to be a need. Why aren't they doing it? Honestly, if I could, I would solve the banking issue in California. Interesting. That, yeah, I mean, I think there's there's a way to do it, and I, I'm sure it is not in my wheelhouse, but if I could do it, I would do it. And what is the issue? The issue is that we're still, you know, the banks are still dropping businesses left and right. Um, pre credit card processing companies drop them left and right. And so it's a serious pain point for these operators because they're trying to operate above board. And when you lose your banking relationship, it gets really challenging. So um, I know that a lot of it has to do with because of the, the federal government, these banks are concerned about it. So anything that I could do that would solve the issues around that. And the reason I say in California is because California is so it's such a massive economy that I'm that I'm very interested in how you could just solve it for just this economy alone and not have to deal with the, the infiltration from the federal government. You're in San Francisco? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, talk to me about uh, let's let's quickly talk about kind of VCs and kind of how they work. Right. So you've raised this capital. My audience, some of them may know, some of them may not know. But how do you think about um, when you're raising capital? What do you tell your LPs in terms of returns they should expect over what period of time? Or, or do you think like that? Yeah. Um, we do. We're very mo we're very modest about stating what our expected returns are because we we like to kind of under promise and over deliver. Um, we said we've been tracking to pay. We we said we wanted to capture the growth of the industry year over year, which has been slated to be at about thirty to thirty six percent. We've been outpacing that. We've been more in the forties, and so that's been good. And so we're hoping to really kind of keep with the growth that we've been having in the portfolio. So, so if someone's listening right now, we have a lot of very, very wealthy individuals that listen to the show and they're going, I want exposure to cannabis. Maybe Emily is, you know, who I should bet on. I mean, should they expect like a 15% IR, 20%, 8%? Oh, I mean, no, I mean, we've been running at more of a 40 to 44% wow. IR. Over yeah. the past three years. Yes. It's amazing. Three and a half years. Yeah. That's really so, amazing. So, yeah. so plan for you is you're doing due diligence. How many companies, I mean, right now, how many companies are you and Morgan actively looking at? So we have kind of like the three phases of diligence where it's like the onslaught of emails every day and introductions that we, that I we bet go you through. get some very interesting emails. 
Oh, I could write a book, but <laughs> no, I respect entrepreneurs. And I think that anyone who's brave enough to put their idea out there deserves someone to read it. So I try to read as many of the emails that I can. I try to respond where we can. Um, so there's that. And I actually use that almost as a trends analysis to see what's really hot in terms of entrepreneurial development in the industry. Um, I can tell you, I, I think I want to launch this thing that's called like what's in Emily's inbox, <laughs> which is a trends analysis, like what startups are happening in the industry. But um, the next phase is really then we're digging in and we're talking to the founders. We're going to meet the companies. That's a big thing we believe in is, is actually going to meet with the teams. Um, and then the third phase is, OK, now we're really getting into the details of the actual financials, the projections, the structures of the company, the the structure of the opportunity and then sourcing uh, potential co-investment mm -hmm. opportunities so that we have uh, strong people coming in alongside us. So how many deals do you look at in a year and how many do you actually do? Oof. Okay, so we've got 30 active companies in the portfolio right now. We've had over 40 in the lifetime of the portfolio. Some of those we've traded out of, some of those we've exited. We've we had marked two to zero and then one, the IP got purchased. So that actually worked out as a game. Surprise. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, you know, at any any day of the week, I'm looking at three to four companies, at least in the email. And so then multiply that out and it's hundreds and hundreds yes. of companies a year. And what's your typical deal size? Well, it's scaled up when the industry, when we first launched the fund, it was a very young, young industry. And so that time it was like 50 to 100,000. Um, if it's a very early stage company, we're probably more in the 200 to 250,000 state. Uh, initial check size now um but we're now writing more around five to one five hundred to a million a million five checks are, so these are like late seed series a or are you typically leading yes we are and i think we're about to lead another really exciting one uh, come, bring them on the show break the news I on will. the show it'll be fun i think you've been introduced to one of them oh so. good Ooh. Yeah. Stay, t stay tuned everybody um, stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> you need your own show that open hook is powerful <laughs> Um, very cool. I'm trying to think, uh, are there any other big things about this industry that I've missed? Um, cause, you know, my, my parents live in Colorado, so I'm exposed to it and it's growing very, very rapidly. Um, what, I guess last question before we wrap up, why did you and your brother decide the biggest, the way that you can make the biggest impact here was by being a VC in the space instead of pulling the capital and the resources you had and just starting your own company in the space? Right. Okay. So it's interesting because we actually started by talking about what company we might want to launch in the space. And then we realized that we weren't really good at one particular area, but we were really good at being curious and investigating things and thinking about business solutions. So Morgan was the one who actually identified this gap that existed between startups needing capital and investors needing a uh, risk mitigated solution by having a diversified portfolio with access to a range of companies. So um, then once we identified that, it just felt like the right fit and we narrowed mm -hmm. in on it and went for it. So. Last thing here before we wrap up with the famous five, pick three babies. Which companies in your portfolio are you most kind of excited about? It doesn't mean they're doing the best, but you're just, you have the most excitement about. Okay. Um, one is Flocana. It is a company in Northern California, and we just did this uh, investment with them both into the company and the real estate. And it's going to be one of the largest processing centers in Northern California. The thing I love about them is that they're working with all the small farmers to process through the facilities that are creating that economies of scale so that these small farmers can continue to exist, which I think is just an awesome aspect of the California industry. And it gets at that big and small business thing in one fell swoop. So I love that story. Flocana. Um, yep, yeah, that's Flocana. Um, Headset is another one, which is a machine learning data analytics company. Um, when I first got into the industry, I was sorely missing actual real-time data about what's happening in consumer behavior. So that's something that's really exciting. Um, and then... Can I do two more? Yes, two more. Okay, two more. One, well, I already gave a shout out to Work. Work yep. is definitely one of my babies. I love that company because I think it's it's making employment safer for everybody on all sides of the spectrum. And I think that's really important to this industry in order for it to grow. And then Baker is really exciting to me because um, they're really that first kind of 
look at how we're doing consumer engagement and, and creating real marketing opportunities and engagement with people to draw them back in and um, engage them in your store or your brand. So um, that's a gap that's been missing. And since we can't, as an industry, advertise through traditional digital solutions like Facebook or Google, um, having that type of a resource is getting increasingly important. So. Well, hey, listen, if you ever, I imagine real estate is obviously another interesting play in this space, real estate investors, just like Warren Buffett bought his first farm and I gave great returns. Um, I, I am wanting more exposure in that space. So if you have any of your companies that are actually gr like growing or you need test space and you need to finance the land, I'm happy to write a big old check and make that happen. I love real estate and I like this industry. So keep, keep, keep me in the back of your brain. I will. <laughs> Many of you listening right now don't have time to listen to every B2B SaaS CEO that I've interviewed. If you want to get access to the database I've created with year-over-year -year growth rates, customer accounts, margins, and many, many other data uh, metrics and data points, you can go to getlatka.com. Here's the thing, though. This that database, I keep it to myself. It's so freaking valuable. And to preserve the quality of the data and make sure that the people that have access to it have a true advantage, I'm only letting 10 companies on each month. So we're full this month, but you can go to getlatka.com to get on the waiting list for next month. And look, there's big people on the waiting list. I mean, the biggest VCs you've ever heard of. You've probably heard of them. They're big, private equity, billions and billions under management. So it's an impressive waiting list. Go get on now at getlatka.com. Guys, big news. Last month was a huge month for the company I recently acquired, which was www.thetopinbox.com. I liked the company so much when I met the person who created it. It lets you send emails later on Gmail, set up reminders like snooze almost to keep your inbox clean, do things like send auto follow-ups, and do open tracking so you know when your emails get opened. It's great if you're in sales or a CEO or trying to be more productive. So listen, I bought the whole company on the spot. Spot, and I want to tell you how I did it. I've showed the deal, by the way, to big, smart people, private equity firms, VCs, and they're dumbfounded. They go, Nathan, how did you do this? We've never seen a deal like this. How did you do this? So I did an unbelievable deal, and I want to show you the income report. So for me to send you the income report, go to www.thetopinbox.com, click the red button that says install this on Gmail, and when you do that, my email will appear. It'll appear in a little uh, Gmail pop-up window. Send me an email and I'll reply immediately with the income report, and you can see how I'm buying and growing small B2B SaaS companies. That's www.thetopinbox.com. Totally free to try and use, www.thetopinbox.com. All right, Emily, let's wrap up here with the famous five. Number one, what's your favorite business book? Oh, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. That's a good one. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying right now? Good question. Uh... Eek, Mark Zuckerberg, that's an obvious <laughs> one, but I do follow and study him. Number three, is there a favorite online tool you have, like HostGator? I like Asana, or Asana. Yep, Asana, yeah, that's yeah. good. Number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? Oh gosh, three to five. Three to five? <laughs> how do you survive? I'm running hard. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's unbelievable. What's your, I mean, are you married, single, do you have kids? Married, I have a three-legged dog. Oh, that's precious. Yeah. Okay, and do you mind me asking how old you are? No, I don't mind, and I'm 37. Nice. Okay, last question. Take us back 17 years. What do you wish your 20-year-old self knew? Oh, man, I wish she just took it easier. That poor girl was working way too hard and too stressed. <laughs> there you guys have it from Emily again launched a VC firm focused on cannabis specifically after her and her brother uh, went through an event when they were younger where their parents passed away and they saw the use uh, that could have made it you know they're basically exiting life much uh, more comfortably uh, 25 million bucks raised doing deals anywhere between you know four or five six hundred grand typically leading late seed and early series a Emily thank you for taking us to the top thank you if you enjoyed Emily today, go back and listen to Julian Marchese yesterday. At just 21 years old, he's launched his own $5 million hedge fund. So how would he do it at such a young age?